No one would have picked a 73-year-old affable former congressman as the one to track down Osama bin Laden. But Leon Panetta has held the toughest jobs in Washington and quietly done what seems impossible. Before bin Laden, Panetta helped balance the federal budget. In a long career, he had been a budget director and White House chief of staff, but by 1997, he left Washington and went home to California. It was 12 years later that President-elect Obama made an odd request. Would Panetta lead the CIA? Panetta had never worked in intelligence, but it was his team that put a Navy SEAL in bin Laden's bedroom. This summer, the president made Panetta Secretary of Defense, in charge of managing three million employees, fighting three wars, and stopping Iran from building an atom bomb. The story will continue in a moment. This last Tuesday, before the president spoke to the nation, he had a few words for Leon Panetta. Good job tonight. Good job tonight. With nearly the entire government assembled for the State of the Union address, maybe 10 people in the room knew what that was about. The Navy's SEAL Team 6 had just rescued two hostages, including an American woman. This time, the action was in Somalia. In how many countries are we currently engaged in a shooting war? It's a good question. <laughs> you know, it's, you uh, have to stop and count. <laughs> stop. I'll have to stop and think about that because, uh, you know, obviously uh, we're going after Al-Qaeda wherever they're, they're at. Uh, and clearly we're, we're confronting Al-Qaeda in, uh, in Pakistan. Uh, we're confronting the nodes of Al-Qaeda in Yemen, in Somalia, uh, in uh, North Africa. When you're Secretary of Defense, it's a small world and a dangerous one. Panetta was covering it when we caught up with him on a trip to Afghanistan, where he has 90,000 troops, Iraq, where the war was ending, and Libya, where he'd helped depose Gaddafi. Panetta travels on a flying command post where he can reach every American warplane, submarine, and missile silo. If the president ordered a nuclear war, Panetta would launch it from what they call the doomsday plane. The president would reach you on this aircraft? The president would, uh, would reach me on this aircraft and very possibly be on this aircraft uh, to uh, be able to direct what happens in that situation. We notice Panetta's Spartan compartment is built for two. Two chairs, two bunks, two phones, for him and the president. But on this trip, Panetta wasn't worried about Russia's thousands of nuclear weapons. He was thinking of what he would do if Iran built just one. Uh, the United States uh, and the president's made this clear, uh, does not want Iran to develop a nuclear weapon. Uh, that's a red line for us, and it's a red line, obviously, for the Israelis. So we share a common goal here. If we have to do it, we will do it. What is it? If they proceed and we get intelligence that they're proceeding with developing a nuclear weapon, then we will take whatever steps are necessary to stop them. Including military steps? There are no options that are off the table. We were surprised to hear how far he thinks Iran has come. The consensus is that uh, if, if they decided to do it, it would probably take them uh, about a year to be able to produce a bomb and then possibly another one to two years in order to uh, put it on a deliverable vehicle of some sort in order to deliver that weapon. Of course, Panetta knows more than he tells. Maybe he knows who's bombing Iranian scientists, why Iran's missile facility mysteriously blew up, or how a computer virus wrecked Iran's uranium enrichment plant. Judging from the U.S. spy drone that fell in Iran, America and its allies are waging war without sending thousands of troops. The doomsday plane is laden with secret gear. We can't show you most of it. It's so heavy, the Air Force refueled it twice in the night sky over the Atlantic. It turned out the lightest thing on board was the heart of the man with a world of worry.
How do you launch the nuclear response from this airplane? I mean, you pick up that phone. Don't touch anything, uh, Scott. <laughs> Leon Panetta is rarely far <laughs> from an eyelid collapsing, ground shaking <laughs> belly laugh. It's involuntary, and to people around him, it's reassuring that with lives at stake, he stays in touch with his humanity and where he came from. Leon Panetta lives on the farm where he grew up. He and his brother planted these walnut trees 65 years ago with their father. And the Panettas stick to their roots in Northern California. He and his wife Sylvia raised three boys here, one of whom served in Afghanistan. Panetta's parents had arrived here from Italy without a word of English. Did you pick the walnuts? I uh, used to pick them uh... All the time. My dad used to have a pole and hook and shake every one of these branches and uh, hit the walnuts. And my brother and I used to be underneath uh, collecting the walnuts, putting them in sacks. And, uh, you know, my, uh, my dad often said I was well trained to go to Washington because I've been dodging these nuts all my life. <laughs> <laughs> His mother wanted a pianist, but Panetta orchestrated a run for Congress and for 16 years represented his home district. He became President Clinton's budget director and worked with Congress to balance the federal budget for the only time in the last 42 years. A lot of people were surprised when your name came up for director of central intelligence. I was kind of surprised as well. I spent most of my life working on budget issues uh, and thought that uh, you know, that would more likely be an area that they, they might want me. Uh, but uh, the president said, I, I need somebody who can restore the credibility of the CIA. And for me, that represented a challenge. The first challenge ordered by the president was to rethink the search for Osama bin Laden. There hadn't been a good lead since the U.S. lost him in 2001 in the mountains of Tora Bora, Afghanistan. Within a year and a half of Panetta taking over as director of central intelligence, the U.S. tracked al-Qaeda couriers to a house in a town called Abbottabad, deep inside Pakistan. Panetta sent satellites, drones, officers, and spies to watch it for eight months, but they were never sure that bin Laden was there. On April 30th last year, Mr. Obama and Panetta made a point of being seen at the White House Correspondents' Dinner. Panetta's belly laugh was heard at every presidential punchline, but both men knew they had just pulled the trigger. SEAL Team 6 would launch in 16 hours. The risks are, were enormous, uh, you know, going in that far, uh, the prospect of detection, uh, the prospect that, uh, you know, one of these uh, helicopters might go down, the fact that once they arrive there, we might, uh, you know, have a, a shooting war with the Pakistanis uh, take place. With all of those risks you were facing, you recommended going ahead with this to the president. Why? You know, uh, in the 40 years I've been in government, uh, this for me was uh, probably the most uh, remarkable operation that I was a part of because everybody played their role uh, in a very effective and responsible way. This was the best case we had on bin Laden since Tora Bora. And because of that, because for 10 years we had run into dead ends trying to track bin Laden down. I thought for that reason alone, we had a responsibility to act. This is Panetta running the mission from CIA headquarters. He acted without telling our Pakistani allies because Panetta just couldn't figure how bin Laden had lived there more than five years undetected, about a mile from Pakistan's military academy, its West Point. Elements of the Pakistani government knew he was there? I personally have always felt that somebody must have had some sense of what, what was happening at this compound. Don't forget, this compound had 18-foot walls around it, 12-foot <laughs> walls in some areas, 18-foot walls elsewhere, a 7-foot wall on the third balcony of the house. It was the largest compound in the area. 
So you would have thought that somebody would have asked the question, what the hell's going on there? Is that why you recommended we not tell the Pakistanis that we were coming? We had seen some military helicopters actually going over this compound. Pakistani military pa helicopters. Pakistani military hel helicopters actually going over the compound. And for that reason, it concerned us that uh, if we, in fact, brought them into it, that uh, they might give, them a, give uh, bin Laden a heads up. I appreciate the diplomatic problems that you have, Mr. Secretary, but everything you're telling me in this interview indicates that the Pakistani government knew he was there and that that's what you believe. I don't, I don't have any hard evidence, so I can't say it for a fact. There's nothing that, uh, that proves the case, but uh, as I said, uh, my personal view is that uh, somebody somewhere probably had that knowledge. And there's one more thing Secretary Panetta noticed after the raid. There was no escape route from the house. It's as if the occupant was expecting plenty of warning. Today, the house is also short one brick. Hanging on the wall of his office, Panetta has a memento that CIA officers brought him, labeled with bin Laden's code name, Geronimo, Abbottabad, Pakistan. Before the raid, President Obama nominated Panetta for Secretary of Defense. He took over seven months ago, these days arriving at the Pentagon at dawn and working well into the night. Last weekend, Panetta was aboard the USS Enterprise in the Atlantic Ocean. They even let the boss clear one of his planes to land. be directing shadow wars in more places than he can count, but one of his biggest challenges now is to manage the massive budget cuts in his big ticket military that have been ordered by Congress. The reality is that we now are facing, uh, as a result of congressional action, uh, having to take down the, the, uh, the defense budget by uh, you know, well over $450 billion over the next 10 years. And that will mean what? We'll have to make some very tough decisions about how we do this. The last thing I want to do is to make the mistakes of the past. We still have to have a military that protects us against a lot of threats that are out there, terrorism, Iran, North Korea, nuclear proliferation, problem of uh, cyber attacks, uh, rising powers like China. That's quite a list for the globetrotting Secretary of Defense, but he told us that the toughest part of his job is right here at his desk. In your long history in government, the one thing that you never had to do was make decisions about life and death. In some ways, uh, in this job, I'm doing it every day. Uh, and the toughest thing in this job, frankly, is writing the condolence letters to, uh, to the parents of those young men and women who are killed in action. And that loss, having been a parent of somebody who's been stationed over there, uh, you know what that means. But I also say to them, you know, your son or daughter is really a true hero and patriot because they were willing to give their life for their country. And that means that they'll never be forgotten. And I hope that's, that's some measure of comfort for them because in the end, it's the only comfort I have is to know that these kids, when they put their lives on the line, are helping America be strong for the future.